안녕하십니까? Hello, I am Dr. Son Young Hee. I'm from Ijeon Dental Office. Today, we are going to talk about maxillary anterior immediate placement of implant. Placing an implant there compared to in other areas, I believe is very challenging. So many doctors are afraid and they get very nervous when they start placing implant in that area. I always get nervous when I place implant immediately after extraction in the maxillary anterior region. In order to achieve good outcome, we have to consider many more factors compared to other regions. So the goal of placing an implant in the maxillary anterior region immediately after extraction, aesthetics needs to be ensured. In order to ensure aesthetics, we need to ensure proper labial bone thickness and maximum soft tissue support and interdental papilla needs to be preserved and healed. These three factors are needed for aesthetic outcome. So for maxillary anterior immediate implant placement needs to consider all these before we place an implant. And there are factors to consider for maxillary anterior region as follows. When we do extraction, it should be a traumatic as much as possible. And the three-dimensional implant positioning is very important in maxillary anterior in terms of horizontal, vertical, and angulation. And how to achieve a primary or initial stability should be considered. And after implant placement, the gap is created. How to manage the gap should be considered. And last but not least, provisional restoration should be considered. How to provide a provisional restoration to a patient, those need to be considered for immediate implant placement. How do we need to consider them? Let's talk about them using a clinical case. A 45-year-old male patient, as you can see, at number 11, mobility is chief complaint. Inferior to crown, there is crown root fracture. Number 11 is decided to be extracted, and immediate implant placement is planned. After removing the post, only root remains. On the CT, there is no lesion or bone loss. It is a sound socket. According to Alien's socket classification, it is a type 1 socket. Sub-tissue support is there and labial bone resorption has not been progressing that much. So this can be type 1 socket. Now we need to extract the tooth. During extraction, trauma to soft tissue and alveolar bone needs to be minimized. So periodontal ligament needs to be cut. It is called periotome. So before extracting a tooth, periodontal ligament should be cut first. You can do it with a blade like this, or you can use a periotome. So after going through all of this, you need to do the extraction to minimize the damage to the surrounding soft tissue or labial alveolar bone. However, in this case, if we cannot have appropriate support so that we cannot do forceps delivery, we can cut the root. 
we can separate the root like this. In this case, I don't think any of you would do that, but it is not a good idea to make mesiodistal grooves for cutting or extraction because mesiodistal cutting of a tooth requires the use of an elevator or a root picker on the labial bone, which may further damage the alveolar bone. So, so the root separation should be in the buccolingual direction. And the first the mesiodistal fragments need to be removed before removing the rest. In this way, we can maximally preserve labial bone and minimize the damage to the bone during extraction. Next, let's talk about implant positioning. To determine the implant positions, we need to do drilling in the upper anterior for immediate implant placement. The most important thing is the initial drilling. Initial drilling should be done in appropriate position, angle, and depth. If we drill in a wrong position, it is very hard to modify the position. It's almost impossible. So the initial drilling is very important. If you look at this illustration, this is the extraction socket after extraction is performed. In the extraction socket on the palatal slope, initial drilling is usually done and you need to maintain the drilling. On the palatal side, the drilling will continue not to invade the apex area. After initial drilling, tapered drill is used to create a drill hole like this. We need to do drilling as much as palatally as possible to preserve the labial bone properly. After final drilling is done, we need to check inside of the extraction socket if drilling hole invades apex part. The drilling hole is pushed to the buccal side a little bit. If apex remains intact, you can say drilling is properly done. So in the drilling hole created on the palatal side, you can place an implant palatally. Of course, in this case also, as you can see, it is placed only contacting palatal wall. So there is hardly any resistance from the labial side. So the implant would probably be pushed to the labial side in terms of the angle. Therefore, we need to pay extra attention to the angle of the implant placed when implant is finally placed. It should be positioned under the cingulum of the definitive restoration. In terms of prosthesis, the labial contour would be a little bit too excessive, but uh, placing like this, considering labial bone, would result in more stable result. After final drilling, the drill is inserted to check the path in this patient, the drill is inserted to check the placement path. It's a little bit drilled toward the palatal side. Then, how much gap in the labial side should be made? In my view, According to many literature, 4 mm gap is considered stable 
If it is less than 4 millimeters, I will explain it later, but it will require other procedures. So you're looking at the drilling hole. It is palatally positioned, which is the best. Based on apex, it should not be, the drilling hole should not be on the labial side. An implant is placed. The buckle gap is what you're seeing right now. In this case, it is not in complete contact with the palatal wall. So this happens a lot. So this is a little bit labially pushed. Looking at this photo, in this patient, screw retained prosthesis would be a little hard to make. In this situation, if we correct the path of the implant to position it more palatally, it is very hard to correct the path. I place an implant in this situation. Buccalingually, 4 mm gap should be present next to vertical position. The reference point for vertical implant position, there are many reference points to place an implant. First, an implant should be 3 to 4 millimeters below the CJ of adjacent teeth. So that is one of the reference points. Second, for the flapless surgery, marginal gingiva should be the reference point for implant positioning. It should be 3 to 4 millimeters below the marginal gingiva. That is, the implant platform should be 3 to 4 millimeters below the highest point of gingiva. Third, proximal bone crest can be the reference point. So an implant should be placed 3 to 4 millimeters below the top of the bone crest of an adjacent tooth. Lastly, labial bone crest, 1.5 to 2 millimeters below the bone, an implant needs to be placed. So these are the reference points for vertical implant positioning. How do we need to choose the reference points? It depends on case to case, biotype, bone loss, and whether there's a defect or not may determine which reference point needs to be selected. For flapless surgery, marginal gingiva can be the reference point. And for a flap surgery, Proximal bone crest needs to be the reference point to determine the vertical implant positions. That should be reasonable criteria. So there are four reference points that you can use. The vertical implant positioning. We need to make the positions for the following reasons because we need to consider biologic width. In order to have sufficient implant biologic width, prosthetically it is also called a running room and it is called a biologic width after the delivery of the prosthesis. As you know, the implant biologic width, 4 mm is an acceptable width from the top of the implant platform and to the top of an abutment junction the soft tissue would be present in the 4 mm gap. The healthy soft tissue needs to be present for the long-term stability of an implant. So vertical positioning of an implant is very important in terms of biologic width. So what I recommend is that uh, it's much better to place an implant deeply than shallowly. I cannot say there's no problem in placing an implant deeply. If it is too deep, of course, there will be problems. But if you place implant shallower than deeper, 
aesthetically and in terms of long-term prognosis is not very favorable. So implant biologic width is four millimeters. So four millimeter soft tissue needs to be present on top of the implanted platform that needs to be considered. Next, we need to consider initial or primary stability to place an implant. In the 1980s, Nazara's paper talked about immediate implant placement for the first time, and he also talked about factors how to get primary or initial stability for immediate placement. It's in the Lazara's paper, 3 mm basal bone should be present below the socket, extraction socket. When the socket is small, we can get the initial stability from the lateral wall. In the maxillary anterior, it is very hard to get the primary stability from the lateral wall. So I don't think it is possible to get the initial stability. In some cases, you can do that, but in such cases, an implant needs to be placed close to the labial bone requiring further bone graft. So it is not possible to get the initial stability from the lateral wall when it comes to the incisors. It can work in the premolar area, especially for the upper premolar area and for a multi-root tooth. Other than that, we need to have a 3 millimeter basal bone below the extraction socket. And when we drill 3 millimeters below the extraction socket, we can place an implant in a better way. So an implant is placed. We can do this without raising a flap, but in this patient, I raised the flap to place an implant. To be honest, I was really wondering how thick the labial bone was, so I didn't raise it a lot, just a little bit at the top. In this patient, if the labial bone is too thin, an external socket graft needs to be done. So that's why I check the labial bone thickness, but I didn't do the graft. So in most cases, in my cases, I use a pre-mount fixture. If you know the dimensions of the mount, it is helpful to understand the vertical positioning for a flapless surgery if an implant is placed three or four millimeters deeper than the marginal gingiva, it is considered good. I recommend four millimeters. So the distance to the mount interference is four millimeters from the platform. Usually the mount driver can go into up to four millimeters. So based on that, you can determine and the implant vertical positions in an easy way. In this patient, the provisional is not delivered. Healing abutment is connected like this. The healing abutment can be used to identify the vertical positions. When you place an implant, if you use, for example, 3 mm healing abutment, and if it is protruded above the gingiva, it shouldn't happen. You should have placed deeper. In this patient, 5 mm healing abutment is connected. As you can see, it is a little bit below the gingiva. This is a stable implant positions. In our hospital, 3 millimeter healing abutments do not exist in our hospital. I don't use them. I don't really use them in the posterior region as well. When we use a healing abutment, it is considered good if it is 1 millimeter above the gingiva. 
So if you use a 3mm healing abutment and 1mm is exposed, that means there is only 2mm gingiva below, which may lead to crystal ball loss in many cases. So in that case, aggressively, an implant should be removed and place it deeper for better long-term outcome or prognosis. When we use a 5mm healing abutment, it's almost all submerged. A good gap always exists when we do immediate implant placement. How can we manage the gap? Internal socket graft only is done in this patient. Internal socket graft only or combined with external socket graft as well. According to Capelli and Testori paper, this is cited a lot. They talk about the concept of IBP. IBP is the distance between the external implant color and the bony surface of the buccal plate. That's called IBP. Depending on the distance, bone graft techniques can be different. That is the summary of the paper based on IBP. If it is less than 4 millimeters internal and external socket grafts need to be done at the same time. That means when IBP is less than 4 millimeters, an implant can be involved or included in the remodeling of the bone during healing. So external socket graft should be done to augment the labial bone. Like this, if there is a defect, there is no problem. We do bone graft procedure and membrane is used for the GBR. But this is a different story. I'm talking about when there is no defect. When there is a defect, you can place implants palatally as much as possible and do the standard GBR. That would be the standard treatment approach. When IBP is bigger than 4 millimeters, so if the distance from the labial bone plate to the labial surface is more than 4 millimeters, internal socket graft only would be good enough. So from the implant color to the labial bone plate, the outer surface, if the distance is 4 millimeters or bigger or below, the bone graft type can be selected. Collagen graft is done in this patient and it is sutured, post opical view and CT view. The labial bone, I believe, the implant itself is a little bit labially placed, a little bit worrisome. If you look at the CT, you understand it should have been placed a little bit palatally, but I couldn't do that. Next, the provisional restoration. There are about three ways. In this case, the bonded type is used. Palatally, a wire is added for the bonded type. The bonded type provisional should not come in contact with the healing abutment or labial gingiva. So it should be a little bit away from them. This is how the bonded type provisional can be made. Another way is A6 type provisional. Wafer printing is done for the surgical site. The surgical site would be filled with resin to make it, to make the provisional. In this patient, there is a crown root fracture at number 11. So if you look at the photos, they were broken and it was extracted. 
a flapless surgery was done. As you can see, a probe is used to identify the vertical position of the labial plate. The probe is inserted and pulled outside until it's bleached. You can see where it's bleached and where not bleached. An implant should be placed below the labial plate, so the vertical position is identified like this. It is drilled. An implant is placed palatally. It should be 4 mm to the top of the connector of the mount. So the implant was placed a little bit deeper than 4 mm. An implant was placed, a healing abutment was connected, and bone graft was done. After that, the healing abutment is removed. A transfer abutment in PMMA is used for the provisional, and sling suture is used to close the gingiva. It is healed at about four months of healing. Zirconia abutment is used for the prosthesis. The standard provisional restoration can also be done in this patient. The patient had very unfavorable conditions for provisional. The clinical crown length was short and uh, she had deep bite. It was a female patient, but I had to provide the provisional. As you know, when the provisional is connected to the implant directly like this, as you know, it should not be in the anterior guidance as well as the lateral guidance, so it is very tricky. For immediate placement in the anterior maxilla, for a single case, there are many situations of a patient, and you need to consider the conditions for provisional. What are the prerequisites? First, implants initial stability should be good. Second, anterior guidance free and the patient should not have a parafunctional habit. If you provide a provisional for a broxist, it will be a big problem. Let's go back to the original case. After the healing, usually I change the prosthesis after four or five months. It is healed. As you can see, the bonded type provisional is removed. With just the healing, Papilla doesn't really completely disappear, it is submerged. If I used two-stage approach, Papilla would not remain. So with healing to a certain degree, interdental Papilla can be preserved. So that's what you see here. And the zirconia link abutment is used for the final prosthesis. The patient is lost to follow up. Contact points were adjusted over several visits to fill the gaps with papilla before finishing the case. Final prosthesis is delivered, and you can see the link abutment. So, immediate implant placement in the maxillary anterior. Summary The conclusion First, you need to do a traumatic extraction. Whether you use periotome separation, root separation, you need to extract as much atraumatically as possible, and initial drilling is everything. You should drill at palatal slope of extraction socket, and at each step you need to check whether the drilling is properly done. So like this, on the palatal slope, the drill hole is created. There are many different implant positions, buccolingual, mesodistal, and vertical positions, especially 
Ocolingual and vertical positions are more important. Of course, other positions are important, but these two are more important. So, in an appropriate optimal positions, implants need to be placed for stable prosthesis in the anterior maxilla, buccolingually, 4 mm or bigger gap should be made and managed for proper stable prosthesis in the alveolar bone. And vertical positioning is very important. We need to use reference points for the positioning. When we use a pre-mount fixture, the mount height needs to be understood to determine the vertical position. Gap filling, as I said before, IBP concept is used if it is 4 mm or bigger, internal graft only. When it is less than 4 mm, internal and external socket graft needs to be done. And that is the criteria to determine the scope of the graft. Provisional restoration, if possible, we need to provide a provisional restoration to a patient. But we should not go overboard. Conventional, bonded, and A6 types are available for the provisional restoration. Today, I talked about immediate implant placement in the anterior maxilla very briefly. Of course, immediate implant placement in the anterior maxilla has wide range of scopes, and there are many other factors to be considered, but I have introduced some of the factors that I consider important. So please keep those in mind for immediate implant placement in the anterior maxilla for a better outcome. This is it for today, and I'll come back next time.